Welcome, everybody, to today's uh, Bioenergy Friday web seminar. Sorry for the technical difficulty getting started, but we are ready to go. And today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Dr. Robert Brown from Iowa State University. And uh, Dr. Brown is um, an expert in the field of uh, biofuels. In particular, um, his expertise has been on thermochemical conversion of biomass to biofuels, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Uh, one of our sponsors I'd like to mention today is uh, a grant from the USDA that's titled Send USA, and uh, that's a, a USDA grant that uh, is a multi-state grant uh, run from Iowa State University working on uh, both production uh, can conversion of uh, biomass to biofuel. Um, so with that, I will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Robert Brown to get us started. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here presenting this same USA webinar. I'd like to talk about a topic that uh, a lot of people aren't very familiar with, and that's what we call the thermal chemical option or uh, thermal chemical production of biofuels. Uh, this is the notion of using, uh, instead of of uh, enzymes and fermentation organisms using heat and catalyst to affect changes in biomass that allow its conversion into biofuels. So I'm going to uh, start by uh, simply asking what is the perfect energy carrier for transportation fuels? So we're all used to the notion of, of gasoline. We can easily pump it into the uh, automobile fuel tank. But if we step back and ask what are the properties that make us uh, want to use a, a, a some form of energy for the purpose of transportation, we'd include these properties listed here. We want it to be a liquid. It turns out that's a, a, a perfect form rather than being a solid or a gas. And we don't want it to mix with water. That's one of the issues that ethanol has today, why some people criticize ethanol. We don't want it to be toxic. That's why we don't use uh, methanol. We want high energy density. That's a problem with uh, hydrogen, for example, as a fuel. Is it slow density? Want to be able to operate in cold weather? Uh, that's my introduction to what the perfect fuel is. And we have what we call a drop-in fuels, which are fully compatible with ex existing fuel infrastructure. Uh, this does not include ethanol because there, it is not perfectly uh, compatible with the gasolines that we use. So a drop-in fuel should be an, a hydrocarbon, or it possibly could be a higher alcohol like butanol. Uh, and, or do these fit the definition of um, a perfect fuel? And my answer was it's, it's close enough. So we want to uh, produce a fuel, but we need to know what we're going to produce the fuel from. There are three kinds of biomasses. Uh, these can be uh, utilized either from a, a biological process like fermentation or the thermal chemical. So I, I think it's important, though, to recognize what our choices are. And these include lipid-rich biomass, which I'll describe a little bit more, lignocellulosic biomass, and waste biomass. And, and waste biomass is just a combination of lipid-rich and lignocellulosic and paper and, and leaves from your yard. It's, it's all kinds of possibilities. I'm not going to talk about that too much. The lignocellulosic feedstock is illustrated here, and, and this is, if, if it was turned over to an engineer, they'd say, well, this is a, a, an, an engineered composite, because it consists of fibers of cellulose, and those are the kind of the purple uh, lines that's shown there in the drawing, uh, that are laid out in a fashion that if they are embedded in a, a matrix, uh, then it will be a very strong, flexible material. And that um, matrix that is something called lignin. And, and that's a, a, a natural a polymer in a biomass. Uh, but this material is, is um, very difficult to break down because nature intended for it not to be broken down. It's, uh, it's intended to resist biological attack. And so using biology to break down lignocellulosic biomass is a very uh, daunting uh, task. And that's one reason uh, I advocate thermal chemical is because that's one thing uh, nature has devised is a fire to, uh, to break down lignocellulosic biomass. Lipid feedstocks are really a neat feedstock in that they are almost hydrocarbons. And this uh, 
uh, chemical formula shown here is the structure of something called triglyceride, which is found in soybeans and microalgae. And if you, if you start counting up, you'll see a lot of carbon and you'll see a lot of hydrogens and you'll see only a very rare oxygen uh, molecule O on the right side of the figure. And so uh, it doesn't take too much effort to pull those O's out. And once you have the oxygen out, then you have a pure hydrocarbon. So that's the beauty of these uh, feedstocks, lipid feedstocks. Now this question is, so should we be using lipids or should we be using lignocellulose? And from what I've described, it would seem like we ought to be focusing on the lipid feedstocks. But this is to illustrate that uh, if we want to uh, produce lipids versus, um, or produce hydrocarbons, if we start with uh, carbohydrate, which is shown, the chemical formula shown up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we're going to have to put it through plant number one, which is something the engineers build. And what they do is end up extracting oxygen off of this, um, off the carbohydrates in the biomass. And at the plant at the bottom is shown a pure hydrocarbon. You notice there's no oxygen there. So engineers know how to do that. But plants also are able to do that. And this is the thing to remember, that if you want to produce a almost hydrocarbon in a plant, uh, it actually has a biosynthesis pathway that's illustrated there in blue and, and uh, pink that involves taking carbohydrate glucose shown at the top and going through a cycle that, uh, like plant number one shown on the left, uh, spits out uh, oxygen in this case in the form of carbon dioxide, it's what we call deoxygenating uh, that glucose, that carbo carbohydrate, and ending up with, you'll see in the figure there, a, a lipid. Uh, so we either can uh, start with lignocellulose and build a plant to do it, or we can grow plants that are able to produce the lipids. But there is energy involved in both of those processes, and I frankly don't know which one of these is the better process to look at. Um, so that's a decision that will ultimately have to be made. Now, if you look at the whole renewable fuels uh, industry and all of the different approaches, there are many ways. So on the left are all kinds of feedstocks that we could look at, and in the center are the technologies that could be applied uh, to break them down at the bottom, you'll see biochemical conversion, which is the idea of using biology to do it. Uh, and then there's different kinds of biofuels. And I'm going to focus on uh, hydrocarbon fuels because that fits the definition of drop-in fuels, uh, one that would allow us to greatly expand the biofuels uh, market because we can only put so much alcohol into our vehicles, uh, it's on the order of 10 or 15 percent. We have to have a lot of changes in engines to get up to 85 percent. It would be a lot easier for the consumer if they didn't have to worry about what their fuel was, what their engine could do, that they can simply use these so-called drop-in fuels. So let's talk about thermochemical biofuels. I like to refer to this as the other cellulosic biofuels because um, most of the emphasis has been trying to convert the carbohydrate in lignocellulose into um, sugars that can then be fermented. We're going to look at uh, two different kinds of, of uh, substrates other than sugars. And one of them is gas, and we get that through a process called gasification. And on the right there, the top uh, photograph is of a gasifier uh, at the Biosentry Research Farm at ISU. And the other approach is to produce something called bio oil. This is a liquid that's produced by a process called path pyrolysis. And that's illustrated at the bottom uh, right of this figure. Um, so if we look at this as a general idea, is we start with a feedstock on the upper left and end up with a biofuel on the lower right. And we've got to have uh, processes that get us there. And the first thing we would look at is depolymerizing or decomposing the feedstock into molecules that uh, are appropriate uh, for some final conversion biofuels. So the center circle is labeled thermolytic substrate, that is, 
uh, we have something comparable to, to sugars that then we send to a ferment, fermenter. But in this case, we'll look at different kinds of processes, and, and we'll call those processes upgrading to get the desired fuel. So I mentioned gasification and fast pyrolysis. That's going to be the emphasis of my talk. There are other technologies that, in some respects, are subsets of these uh, or generalizations of these, um, but I'm going to just focus on gasification and fast pyrolysis. So this slide shows the process of, of gasification, which is the thermal decomposition of, of any kind of organic matter into flammable gases. Uh, it is uh, something akin to combustion, but instead of just producing blue gas, carbon dioxide, and water, it produces flammable gases, things like hydrogen, uh, methane, uh, carbon monoxide instead. And the process um, is interesting in that it can consume virtually any feed, uh, organic feedstock that you throw at it. It doesn't care if it's uh, leaves raked from your yard or switchgrass grown or wood uh, or just about any type of organic material. Uh, and here's illustrated two of uh, the major gasification options. Uh, there are other kinds of gasifiers, but they tend to be for very small applications. Uh, the nice thing about these two reactors is they scale. They scale to plants that um, could, could easily uh, be sized at 2,000 tons per day, for example. On the left is what's called a fluidized bed. It takes biomass and injects it into a bed of sand that has air injected in the bottom, so it it behaves like a fluid, hence the name fluidized bed. Very good mixing, very good heat transfer, and the gases are released and uh, go out through the top of this reactor. Uh, this has actually been the reactor that has been used the most with biomass. On the right is what's called an entrained flow gasifier. It's really a very simple idea. It's, let's just blow biomass in with oxygen at, into a hot environment and uh, as it sweeps along, it um, turns into a, a gas, and we can control the temperature with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, various ways of controlling the oxygen or steam that's put into the system. Seems like a simple system. It is actually fairly difficult to engineer, and it really works best in a very, very large scale system. It has not been proven out very well with biomass. It works very well with coal because it turns out biomass is actually easier to gasify than coal. But there is work uh, trying to adapt this to biomass. Uh, the product of gasification is syngas, short for synthesis gas. As I've already stated, it's mostly carbon monoxide. Hydrogen carbon dioxide is a product as is methane. Well, that's wonderful because we can use that then to synthesize uh, useful compounds from it. The difficulty is syngas contains a lot of contaminants, and I've listed here tar, alkali metals, sulfur, nitrogen, and chlorine. And it, it'd be nice if we had one process that removed all of them, but I'm trying to illustrate here at the bottom is it actually takes a separate what we call a unit operation to remove each of those. So every different contaminant is going to have a different uh, reactor system that's going to clean it up. And I, I point that out because that's one of the downsides of gasification is every time you put in a unit operation, you put in a few more million dollars into the operation, and after a while it all adds up to a very expensive capital cost for gasification. But it turns out gasification is fairly efficient. People look at, oh, you're burning this material and you've got to put heat into it. Isn't this very inefficient? The answer is no. Uh, it actually can be very efficient. Uh, energy efficiency being maximum 100% we can achieve as high as 95% with uh, certain types of gasifiers. It may be as low as 70 90% uh, for uh, simpler types of design. I've already talked a little bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages, but I, I do need to point out that among the advantages is it tolerates relatively dirty biomass feedstock. I give us those waste streams, wherever they come from, this system will consume them and turn it into a useful intermediate. Uh, and that intermediate is very uniform. Uh, it's just a, a few molecules that uh, tend to react well together 
And so that's an advantage over, say, producing a whole bunch of different sugars or acids or things that often occur in some other processes. And it works. Um, I have to point out that Nazi Germany, when uh, the Allies denied them access to petroleum in Romania, they turned to their chemists and they built gasifiers. They didn't use biomass, they used coal. And uh, they had a substitute. South Africa, during the apartheid era, they were cut off from sources of petroleum. They built gas fires and used coal, and they still run those today, even past the apartheid era. So it works. Um, the disadvantage is, is that, I've mentioned already, you have to clean up the gas stream. Uh, typically, we'd like to operate these systems at high pressures. Getting solid biomass into a pressurized reactor is not a lot of fun. I'll tell you, we've, we've done it. Um, and it uh, adds to the cost. Both of these disadvantages add to the cost. So typically, they have fairly high capital cost compared to some of the alternatives. Once we have a thin gas, we don't want to put that in our engines or even run it into our homes uh, for, for a substitute for natural gas. Uh, it is not of the quality of natural gas. Instead, we want to upgrade it. And there's two basic ways to do that. One is to use a catal catalyst, metal catalyst, uh, at moderate temperatures and high pressures. And uh, through a, a number of different technologies, uh, can convert that into liquid fuels. Uh, up the upper right figure is of a, a Fischer-Tropsch reactor that is able to turn this gas into a liquid suitable for transportation fuels. But another possibility is uh, shown here. It's uh, called thin gas fermentation. What we actually do is um, run the gas into a fermenter. And there are appropriate microorganisms that are able to take that gas and convert it into liquid products. One most prominently is ethanol. It also can uh, produce lipids that, if you recall, are fairly easy to upgrade. So I'm going to move on to pyrolysis. Pyrolysis uh, is actually very similar to gasification. Some people have trouble distinguishing between the two. If you just look at the reactors and think about the high temperatures and uh, process conditions. But more generally, we define it as the thermal decomposition of carbonaceous material in the absence of oxygen. With that definition, it sounds like gasification. But what's different? is that there is a multiplicity of products. Depending on how we tune the reactor, we get gas, solids, and liquids. And I'm illustrate here how easy it is to, uh, produce, uh, to perform pyrolysis. So this is somebody burning uh, the, uh, the waste material from their gardens in their backyard. Well, that white smoke is bio oil. And uh, the only difference from what's going on here and what we do in the laboratory is, one, we control the process, and two, we make sure this uh, smoke is captured rather than uh, bother the neighbor. So uh, that white smoke is actually fine aerosols of a liquid that we can capture. When we capture it, we call it bio-oil. The many phases of pyrolysis, I mentioned how we control the process will determine the relative proportions of solid liquid and gas. Uh, the, um, the first thing that we can do uh, is called carbonaz carbonization. And this is a very slow process, and the predominant product is charcoal. So we'll talk a little bit about charcoal later on, but our goal is not to maximize charcoal production. Um, but this is the way they used to do it. They would uh, pile up wood, get a fire going, and then they'd cover it with dirt and uh, basically starve the, the combustion process, and it would go to a, a pyrolysis mode, and the result was charcoal. So this in itself is a, is a fascinating process. You'll see this white smoke. Again, they're producing some bio oil here as well, but most of the product is charcoal. Yields of, uh, as shown here, up to 33% yield of the biomass. But there's another form of pyrolysis that I'd like to focus on, and we call it fast pyrolysis. Instead of occurring over days, it occurs in less than five seconds. Uh, it's very high heating rates, 
and the temperatures are a little bit higher than slow pyrolysis at 500 to 650 degrees centigrade. And this is the product of fast pyrolysis. It is predominantly an oil product, a liquid product. This looks like petroleum. It is not. It has the, um, the aroma, if you will, of um, hickory smoke, a barbecue. Um, some people like it and some people don't because this is a very concentrated barbecue smell. Um, fast pyrolysis, by definition, is a rapid thermal decomposition of organic compounds in the absence of oxygen to produce predominantly liquid product. Contrast this with gasification, which is to produce predominantly gas. Uh, so these, this is a, a summary of some of the conditions specifically that are required to get liquid predominantly instead of, of gas. And you can see the yield can be up to 60 to 70 percent of um, oil, which is what we want. Now, if you're really interested in what's in this oil, um, it's, um, it's quite a long list, and these are family of compounds. These are not specific compounds. But saccharides is sugars, and sugars is a sugar that's missing a, a molecule of water in it. You, so you can see the total uh, saccharides, if you will, can total up to something like 10%. We're working on some technologies to try to double or triple that amount of sugar production. But there are all kinds of other compounds, like uh, this is actually predominantly um, acetic acid, so a strong vinegar, if you will. Lots of chemicals in there. And it is also an energy efficient process. Uh, we can convert as much as 75 weight percent of the of biomass into this oil with an energy efficiency of 70%. Or more. I apologize for all the emails coming in this morning. It's been been busy morning already. Uh, fast pyrolysis opportunities and challenges. Fast pyrolysis is very appealing to a large number of people, whether they want to uh, grow biomass or produce the biofuels. Uh, one of the advantages is the oil is very appropriate for upgrading using petroleum refining technology. And so that means we can produce hydrocarbons using existing infrastructure. And since we've spent billions on infrastructure across the United States uh, to convert petroleum into fuels, it would be nice to use uh, this technology to turn biomass into those same kinds of drop-in fuels. The other very attractive feature of this is we can build these at fairly small scale. Like here is illustrated, a, a quarter ton per day unit. We typically want to scale this up to 50 to 200 tons per day. And you say, boy, it's going to get a lot bigger. But it, it doesn't scale in volume that as, as fast. Uh, so this notion that we can build fairly small units, distribute them across the landscape, produce an oil that you put in a, a tanker truck and move to a centralized facility where you would upgrade it, i.e. to a refinery where we, you would upgrade it to fuels. Now, sounds like lots of important advantages, but there are disadvantages that we're working hard to overcome. One is that there is a lot of water and there is a lot of oxygen in bio-oil as it currently exists. We're looking to drive the water out. We're looking at utility processes to get the oxygen out and make it more stable, because right now it is fairly unstable in storage. Uh, it tends to uh, thicken up, if you will, which isn't too good if you're trying to pump it around a, a refinery. And the application of bio-oil, you can use bio-oil as is in stationary power, for example. You just pump it into a burner. Um, we have a faculty member at ISG that has demonstrated that at several different scales. You can produce commodity chemicals. I showed there are a lot of different chemicals. Uh, the trick then is how can you uh, get a purified form of it? And there are ways to do that, and we're, we're trying to make some advances in that area. But most of our focus has been in the production of transportation uh, fuels. And I want to point out we can also get lots of sugars and even something we call bioasphalt out of bio oil. We've got a process where we produce what we call stage fractions. That's SF1 through SF5. We could increase or decrease that number. And what we're doing is driving the water down to the, the fifth fraction 
This is, this is a strong balsamic vinegar, if you will. And these fractions, SF1 and 2, are very dry. And they contain, when we wash this stuff, we wash out the soluble part and discover that it is sugar. And we get a solution that is uh, so highly concentrated in sugar that we would actually have to dilute it to use it in a traditional fermentation. We also uh, get the non-soluble part out. You know, we refer to that as the raffinate. And it is a material that is very, very much like the bitumen that is in um, asphalt. And we've actually uh, worked with some factory on campus where we have formulated um, asphalt uh, substitutes with this material. I can't go away with, from this talk without mentioning biochar. Any thermochemical process in rapidly heating biomass and drives off volatile compounds, gases and vapors and liquids, and leaves behind a solid residue that you look at it and you say, well, isn't that just charcoal? Yes, it's charcoal. And this is a, a scanning electron microscope of what that charcoal looks up like up, up close. Uh, generally, we've looked at it as a pretty useless byproduct. And my goal has always been to try to minimize the amount of charcoal that's produced. But we're finding out that this charcoal material has some amazing properties that some early researchers discovered when they, you know, in the old days, you used to dump the charcoal out in the back. <laughs> and they find that the, the plants were growing this charcoal much better than they were in the area surrounding it. And discovered it had some remarkable uh, properties in terms of agriculture, horticulture. Um, and uh, this, this uh, biochar, uh, some of the inspiration actually came from the terra soils in the uh, Amazon uh, basin. Uh, on the right here, we're illustrating what's called oxysols. You'll notice that uh, it is a, a Mars red color. <laughs> that means it doesn't have any <clears throat> carbon in it. There's no soil organic matter, virtually. There's a little bit right up at the surface of the soil. On the left here is adjacent soils to these oxysols in, in the Brazilian basin, Amazon basin. And you'll notice it is full of carbon. Very dark earth, almost look as good as, as Iowa soils and anywhere in the Midwest. But in fact, this carbon has been measured to be charcoal that uh, deliberately or accidentally was added to the soils. And these soils are much more productive than the soils shown here on the right. And hence, uh, the community of researchers have referred to it as biochar to indicate not only its origins, but its applications. Biochar turns out to have both physical and biological effects. Most prominently, <clears throat> it um, reduces the density of the soil. It improves the water holding capacity. It holds nutrients in the soil better. It actually reduces the rate of uh, conversion of nitrogen into, um, into nitrogen oxides that are emitted into the atmosphere. <clears throat> It also has greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, there's a number of them. The ones showing going up would actually <clears throat> tend to increase the emissions. But there are a number of things that reduce CO2, or I should say greenhouse gas emissions, from soils that have biochar incorporated in them. And uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into these, but I would encourage anyone that's as fascinated with this topic as I am is just to, to um, Google biochar or Terra Preta and we'll discover all kinds of interesting articles on this subject. But uh, why it's of interest to us is it gives the opportunity to improve the sustainability of biofuels agriculture. You think about it, if we remove large amounts of biomass, we reduce the amount that could be recycled as soil carbon or even the nutrients that are removed and not used in the fuels, but they're removed from the land. By returning biochar, we're not only returning carbon, but we are returning a variety of nutrients that are found in the biochar, specifically um, potassium and phosphorus. And I think this is just an extra slide here. 
And uh, some of my inspiration in this area is a fellow by the name of James Lovelock, who has uh, made a lot of uh, observations on on the atmosphere, on uh, the operation of the planet ecosystems. He made a statement recently, is there's one way we could save ourselves, and that is through the massive burial of charcoal. It would mean farmers turning all their agricultural waste into non-biodegradable charcoal and bury it in the soil. And uh, this is, um, there is, there is a, a lot to be investigated in this area. Iowa State University has committed quite a bit of effort to that, as has the SIM USA uh, regional project uh, that this is part of. And I'm going to just end, um, I guess this is an advertisement for ISU's facilities to, to support thermal chemical research. Um, much of our work is done in what's called the Biorenewables Laboratory, shown here. And here are a number of the students uh, over the last few years that have conducted research in pyrolysis and gasification and upgrading. And there's also something called the ISU Biocentry Research Forum. It's about six miles from the ISU campus that supports pilot scale facilities. Here's our pyrolyzer and here is our gasifier unit. Because there's still a lot of questions that have to be answered about thermal chemical technologies, but we're discovering that uh, there is a, a growing interest in this area because of its ability to process a number of types of feedstocks and producing drop-in biofuels.